the start. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Alejandro Baer. I'm the director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And um, the lecture that we have today is part, I would say it's the closing event of a collaborative, a uh, research collaborative titled Reframing Mass Violence uh, that the center has done together with the Human Rights Program. And we have gone, we've done a, a big detour uh, through Spain, Latin America, and Eastern Europe, mass violence, the legacies of mass violence, and the ways of representing, of addressing, of revisiting, of interpreting mass violence in these different contexts. So now we close, uh, even if we will continue the conversation, that we close the series of events on reframing mass violence on something that is right here in our backyards, uh, which is the atrocities committed uh, against uh, Native Americans in Canada and in the US. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Adam Muller today with us, who's a professor at the Department of English Film and Theater at the University of Manitoba, the U of M on the other side of, of the border. I you know we learned uh, mm. that they also say U of M, and it's quite, quite confusing. What we're doing at the U of M there, and so uh, Adam, uh, areas of specialization is representations of war, genocide, uh, and mass violence, human rights, memory studies, critical theory, cultural studies. So as you see from these areas, it's a perfect fit for this reframing mass violence discussion that we're having uh, between different faculty and students across the university. Uh, I want to mention his most uh, recent publication. He's the co-editor of a book titled The Idea of, human, of, the Idea of a Human Rights Museum. And this is the first book to examine the formation of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg. And it situates this museum within the context of the international proliferation of uh, such institutions. And uh, today, um, Adam will tell us about this fascinating project that he's working on, and uh, that is also in progress. Interesting theoretically, interesting substantially, interesting in the way he also reached out to the communities. And uh, we very much look forward, and we're very grateful to have you here today. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. I want to thank Alejandro for uh, suggesting I come down here. I've wanted to visit University of Minnesota. I've actually been in Winnipeg for 17 years, and for whatever reason, I've never had occasion to come down. And this is uh, a marvelous. Oh! Here's the microphone. Oh, uh, yeah, where is the microphone? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'll try and project a little more. There is no microphone, so I'll try and project a little better, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, I wanted to, uh, I, I, can, I can throw my voice. Yeah, yeah. I'll use my big lecture voice, instead of my, my small lecture voice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wanted to come down here for a long time. This is a great opportunity to do so. Um, it's an exciting time to be doing um, the, kind of, the, the kind of work that I'm going to be speaking to today um, that is encompassed by the Embodying Empathy Project. Um, and uh, not least because it, I think it intersects with a variety of discussions that are, are, are ongoing in the United States generally and Minnesota in, in particular. So I'm very, very happy to be here. I wanted to thank uh, Jennifer Hammer as well for helping coordinate the visit, Rachel and the Travel Office, and everybody associated with the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. I'm, I'm genuinely grateful for being here. Now, at the University of Manitoba, I would ordinarily begin, as we now begin all of our talks, by acknowledging that our university is located on Treaty 1 territory, um, on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I would go on to say that the university and, uh, and the forks of the city of Winnipeg lie at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, the Métis, the Cree, the Dakota, and the Oji Cree nations. Um, and I actually looked around to see what the equivalent such expression was at the University of Minnesota. Um, and it turns out there is no equivalent expression at the University of Minnesota, near, near as I can tell. Um, and I think one of the reasons why embodying empathy uh, exists is to foreground um, the indigenous experience of settler colonialism in ways that make acknowledgement of uh, 
a, a land's prehistory, uh, pre-European history possible, and a way that acknowledges also the vicissitudes of, of settler colonialism um, in, 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 in all, uh, all such contexts as this one. So I wanted to show you this image by way of getting started. And the image is of a young resident uh, student of the Regina Indian Industrial School. It was taken in 1897. It's a very famous image in the context of uh, discussions about Canadian Indian residential school system. And the student's name is Thomas Moore. We actually know very little more about him. Um, the name itself, of course, can let you know something about the religious orientation of the school that he was a part of. And um, although officially a kind of industrial school in the sense that it was, it was designed to equip um, indigenous students with uh, trade skills, um, these, these schools really didn't do much of that at all. They basically exploited the students for cheap labor and sent them off into the world um, to flounder more or less on their, on their own. And we know actually very little or actually nothing about what happened to Thomas Moore after he left the Regina Indian, uh, uh, the Indian Industrial School. But I think the image is, is really striking. It's striking for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, most obviously, um, it conveys information concerning the dramatic loss of culture experienced by Thomas Moore over the course of his education in uh, the residential school. Um, I think what we need to understand is that, that this is at one level most, most obviously a representation of uh, a civilizing process. Um, it's not just a civilizing process, it's also a kind of, of a pacification process that we see being dramatized in the before and the after image here. We see a child wearing uh, indigenous garb that's not actually um, consistently authentic, we know that. Um, we see him equipped with a weapon in the first instance, and in the second instance, of course, not. He's scowling in the first photograph. He looks relaxed and at ease, much more at ease in the second image. And of course, in the second image, he actually looks whiter than he does in the first image. So we actually have, I think, in this, in this really kind of extraordinary um, uh, double frame, what we have is uh, essentially the, the raison d'etre, the formal raison d'etre, um, or a graphic de depiction of the formal raison d'etre of the residential school system. This is what it was supposed to do for um, indigenous people. Now, what's interesting about it for me, given the kind of work that we're doing in embodying empathy, which I, I will explain, I'll go on to explain, is that um, really what this image gives us are what I'm gonna, maybe want to call the surface signifiers of Thomas More's transformation. So we can look at it and we can say, okay, the school made him a different person in these, in these ways, yeah? Um, what we don't get from this image, and what I think is missing from much of our understanding of what went on in Indian residential schools, is what it felt like to be Thomas More before and then after. In other words, this image doesn't actually sort of open up Thomas More's experience to us um, uh, in a way that allows him to speak, right? So what we're doing in embodying empathy is working in the context of this multidisciplinary, critical, and creative project um, to use emerging digital technology to construct a virtual Indian, Canadian Indian residential school. And I think the Canadian part's important. I won't be able to go into it in great detail here, but there are differences, significant differences between the ways in which the residential school systems were managed in Canada and the way they were managed in the United States. Uh, my colleague and collaborator on this project, Andrew Wolford, um, has done an enormous amount of work on this. He's a Fulbright scholar. Um, recently, the byproduct of that work has just appeared um, in a University of Nebraska press publication where he sort of maps the salient differences between these two, two schooling systems. One of the most obvious differences is that the Canadian system, the Indian residential school system, um, was largely administered and run by churches. And the, um, the Indian residential school system in the United States was, was, was typically not. And then, of course, there were different disciplinary models um, at play in each of these videos as a result of who was actually administering. Um, so th this is something that I'm not expert in. I'm not really sort of, I mean, I can talk a little bit about it, um, but it's not, it's not really my, uh, my, my area of expertise. But there are differences, so we're talking about the Canadian context here. Um, the project itself, and I want to mention this, it, it is funded, we finally got funding for it, and I want to talk about why it was hard to get funding for this project too. 
um, because it has to do with um, uh, what, what it means to decolonize a research methodology, because we're working within what we hope is a decolonizing um, analytical research frame, right? And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit today about what that means. Um, but it has been, um, uh, I guess, we're in our second year of the project now, um, and uh, we received a large uh, partnership development grant from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of, of Canada after knocking and getting smaller pots of money for about three years before that. So we've done, we put a fair bit of time into this. Finally, we've got enough money to make the project, uh, make the project work. Okay. Um, what I'm going to try and do today then is talk about something that's unfinished, uh, very much in media res, right, in the process of becoming. And part of the reasons for talking about it in this way at this time is that we need to be engaging in a conversation about what we're doing so that we can take on board reservations, ideas, um, and intuitions so as to help keep our project um, responsive, reasonable, and, and just, right? And this is, so I want to share what we're doing, uh, take feedback, and I'll take feedback to my collaborators um, who I'm meeting with actually we're having a large scale, uh, like a large group meeting next week. Um, so the, the timing of this is all very, very good. I'm not going to go into this map very much, but I just want to give you a sense that the, pro the project has been broken down into a variety of task groups. The task groups include a kind of consultative task group that Andrew uh, is responsible for working. We're all, these overlap, like we're all part of uh, well, the, 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 the four main principles. Uh, myself, Struan Sinclair, Theodore Fontaine, who I want to talk about, and Andrew Wolford. Um, we're part of all of the different task groups, but we've sort of carved out different areas of responsibility. Mine is primarily a kind of theoretical responsibility. I'm doing the big picture. We're trying to stitch the different parts of the project together. Andrew's been responsible primarily for working with our indigenous stakeholders and with an advisory committee that we have assembled of residential school survivors who are guiding this project and giving us the input we need to, uh, to make it, to make it uh, proper, properly work. Um, we have a tech, uh, a tech design uh, task group being administered by Struan Sinclair, who um, runs the Arts Media Lab at the University of Manitoba, is also a very successful um, novelist and creative writer. Um, and we have a research group that's actually um, headed by the head of our archival studies program, who's looking into um, the archival record of, of uh, the, the residential schools now located in the National Center for National Research Center for Truth and Reconciliation um, at the University of Manitoba, which just opened about a month ago. Um, it's a it's the repository of the entire archive of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that looked into the um, harms done by Canada's Indian residential school system and related church and government records. So they're all being. Um, relocated to the University of Manitoba and over the next five years we'll be in a purpose-built building um, with massive servers that will make all of this material available online. Now there's issues with that that we can talk about too having to do with some survivors concern about access being given to their testimony that was given um, in confidence or they understood it to be in confidence and a countervailing kind of pressure from within the indigenous community to make this information available. Um, in, the, in the name of reconciliation and justice, right? So they're, they're, this, not, this is not an uncomplicated program, uh, 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 process in, 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 any, in any respect. And um, our own project is sort of moving in and out of those debates in, in I think, really interesting ways. Um, so we have the design group, we have the research group, and then we have an experimental uh, group being administered by um, a colleague in psychology, Catherine Starzik who um, is an expert on human empathy and runs, uh, currently runs an empathy lab and looks at, um, is, is a specialist in affect, looks at the way in which um, our capacity to empathize with others um, can be mobilized to beneficent social effect. Okay, so that's, that's essentially her area of expertise. Um, I think it's worth noting at the outset that, I mean, part of the raison d'etre for um, embodying empathy was the fact that most of the discussion that's taken place, at least in the Canadian context, in terms of what to do with the knowledge that was generated as part of the truth and reconciliation process, has really been geared towards reforming the primary and secondary school curriculum. Um, there's a sense that um, survivors can go and find out information about other uh, students they may have known, relatives they may have uh, contact with who went to the residential school system. But essentially, in terms of, in terms of its wider social value, the sense was that well, we need this archive. We need this the the, 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 the information about the, the truth about the residential school system um, to make young people better aware of 
um, the history of indigenous people's exploitation and abuse by um, settler Europeans in, in, in Canada, right? Um, and I've seen it myself with my own children and, and, and well, my eight-year-old anyway in school who's already learning about the Indian, knows what a residential school system is, has gone already at, at seven years old last year, went to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and started getting a kind of human rights education. They started in grade two. Um, now and, and so I've seen these sort of structural reforms taking place in the in the school curriculum. But at the end of the day, I think what's happening are the tendency is to assume that really these students um, are going to be given a set of facts about the history of Canadian um, uh, European treatment of Indigenous people, and that's going to somehow be enough. Like somehow knowing the facts is going to be is is going to be um, enough. And I think what we have taken as our point of departure from this uh, this general outlook is the idea that um, the facts might not, in fact, uh, don't necessarily at all guarantee that those exposed to them will come to care about what's happened to indigenous people. And they won't, and they won't care for uh, supervening reasons like prevailing racism, for example, um, and, and inherited prejudice, for example. A crass cultural stereotyping that exists in a variety of, of domains with respect to indigenous people and so on and so forth. So merely knowing what happened isn't enough necessarily to move people um, to comport themselves uh, more morally, more justly um, in relation to uh, indigenous Canadians who um, are experiencing a variety of kinds of, of disadvantage and who also um, are in many cases also thriving despite having endured the experience like um, the experience of the Indian residential schools. That's something else too, right? Um, the story of settler colonialism in Canada is two stories. It's a story of, of, of barbarism, but it's also a story of survival. And to somehow get both of those stories understood and, um, and appreciated and to have students sort of moved to uh, uh, change their baseline dispositions with respect to indigenous people is, is, is obviously of a major concern for us in this, in this context. Um, what we're seeking to do, in effect, is um, somehow getting um, those exposed to the embodying empathy um, digital story world, getting them to enter into the lives of indigenous people in ways that will make them care. Right. That's, that's, the, that, that's the ambition. Um, but it is a research project. And I think it's worth sort of noting at the outset that um, we don't know if we can make people care simply by having them um, immersed in a particular way in a particular set of experiences, right? Um, we, we hope that it will. We hope that, in fact, um, we, we have tools at our disposal that will enhance empathetic identification and through empathetic identification contribute to social action. But at this point, and in the secondary literature, there, there, there's no clear sense that we will succeed. Okay, we may or may not succeed. Um, so like, we're really kind of preoccupied, I think, with this idea that we, we, need, to, we, we need to promote, like it's obvious for a variety of level, uh, levels, that we need to promote a shift in attitudes with respect to Canadians' outlook vis-a-vis -vis Indigenous people. Um, how best to achieve that, um, we're not sure. Um, what we are sure of, though, is that museums, especially ideas museums like the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, are spending vast sums of money on immersive technologies that they believe will somehow get museum goers to care more about the stories that they encounter in that way. What we don't know is whether any of that money is being wisely spent or, or not. There's just, there's just no data. In fact, the data is super contradictory on that. And so that's part of this research project as well. Um, and so we've gone into this hoping for the best, but fundamentally remaining agnostic. We are by far and away not sure that notwithstanding the hundreds of thousands of dollars we're put, committing to this, that in fact we will be able to do the work that so desperately needs to be done. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the, the pragmatics of this. I'm going to go on to talk a bit about why people concerned about genocide should care about this project and so forth. But, um, I think, you know, when we talk about the interface, the way in which people will be sort of interacting with the digital domain that we're creating, which will be purpose-built for this, we will be using, we're actually, um, part of the partnership that we've created includes private sector tech firms and computer technologists, and so Winnipeg is a gaming hub, 
it's where a lot of work is getting done on, on sort of cutting edge gaming technologies. We're importing at least some of that programming skill uh, or some of those programming skills into the construction of a digital environment that's going to be, um, uh, well, as tra transparent and dynamic as possible. Okay, we want it to be a world that, when experienced, is experienced as though it were real. Um, not, uh, and remember, like for most of us, when we think about virtual reality technologies, we're thinking about technology that's at least one or two iterations out of date. We're not looking at the leading edge of the of, 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 of programming there. We're actually trying to capture or ride the leading edge by bringing in professionals who are, are doing this for a living to help us animate the stories that are going to be at the heart of this project. Um, we also, partly because this is a digital domain, we're able to use the interface, the way in which the, the devices that um, users make are, 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 are wear in order to access the world, we're able to use those to integrate user feedback into the world. Right? There's all, there, there are haptic interfaces that we've been experimenting with um, that allow uh, users to actually manipulate objects in the virtual world. It's, a, it's an uncanny experience, actually to um, uh, wear a VR headset. And I'll talk a little bit about the one that we're, just very briefly, but we're, we're going to be using the Layer programming language. And um, we're using Oculus Rift, which should probably be, if you haven't heard about already, you'll be hearing much more about it in 2016, where I think it goes on the mass market. Um, but you'll notice about it that it's extremely lightweight. Um, it's small. Like, I remember, uh, I ran a media lab uh, about, <laughs> 10 years ago, and they were talking about v virtual reality technology. Honest to God, the headset I wore was like a bicycle, like a motorcycle helmet. <laughs> had wires coming into it. It was, it was really, really clunky. And you were always aware that you were wearing that thing. Now, you will be aware, obviously, that you're wearing something. But this is, like, comparatively speaking, extremely light. It's going, to, it's going to help be conducive to the kinds of transparency that we're looking for in this, in this particular representation. Um, but we're able to have users in the virtual world change the world. We're not dealing with a static virtual environment. This is one of the key features of this world. In other words, those exposed to um, a demonstration uh, of a student suffering, for example, a student may be hungry, and the, the accounts of hunger sort of pervade the accounts of residential school life. Food was used as a coercive uh, tool in, in these contexts. There's stories about um, how parents would come on visiting days on Sundays and always bring fresh fruit. And the fresh fruit would be taken away from the students and put on a shelf at the back of the main dining hall, and the students would get to eat the fruit if they comported themselves well during the week. It would be used as a kind of reward. But if, they if there was any infraction in the rules or discipline during the week, the students would be uh, denied access to this fruit. And with the fruit like bananas, um, you know, they would sit high up on this on the shelf and the students would watch this fruit rot throughout the course of the week until by the end of the week, of course, it would be largely um, inedible. And so, um, you know, the kid, and kids would experience one, they'd experience hunger, they wouldn't be fed as well as the, the priests um, in the schools that we're looking at. And it might be possible for somebody using this world to actually provide sustenance to a student that they witness um, who is experiencing hunger, right? More than that, they can leave traces of themselves as users of this world that are available for other people to see. So in using the world and entering into it, one's not just experiencing uh, a representation of, uh, that, that, that's really a kind of a representation of something in the past, there's going to be a kind of presentness to it insofar as traces of other users, just like the people um, uh, using it in a particular moment, will be visible or detectable in the changes that they've made to the world that others can then, uh, can then use. So those are kind of some of the design parameters that we're working with. Um, we want it to be interactive. We want it to be immersive. Um, and we want it as much as possible to contribute to meaningful engagement um, with a wide range of Indian residential schools ex experiences. And we spent the last more than a year um, consulting with survivors of residential schools to try and determine which experiences for them are most paradigmatic of life in the residential schools. Um, and. Uh, we have now, I think, we're moving into the design phase, so we've now been able to whittle things down so that we have a better sense of, of, of what we need to see in that context. We want the world to be self-regulating. Um, we want, uh, again, as I say, to integrate user input into the world, and we want the world to evolve. Okay, And, and I think also, through evolving, we somehow want users to take ownership of their bodies in that environment. 
right? We want them to experience the world as, as something that they are embodied in, as opposed to just spectators outside of it. It's not going to be a televisual experience where they're witnessing something out there. They're going to be inside this world. And this insideness is going to give them um, a kind of ownership over those experiences that we, based on some of the psych literature, we, we believe will be conducive to the forming of em empathetic bonds. Um, and I just wanted to show you very briefly has shown that people tend to respond realistically to events and situations in immersive virtual reality. I'm not gonna Take say the f shirt, calm. Calm, calm, calm. calm. What's going on, man? An additional possibility for virtual reality is to show people with the virtual body. But to what extent do we have the illusion that this is your body? And what are the consequences of this? The most well-known example of such body ownership illusions is the rubber hand illusion. Synchronous stroking when a person's hidden real arm and an aligned visible rubber arm can result in an illusion of ownership over the fake arm. And the person will react when we try to harm the fake arm. <laughs> the rubber hand delusion also works in virtual reality, where people report ownership towards a virtual arm. So just because it looks like a digital representation doesn't mean we don't feel like it's us, right? And it's being us matters in terms of our capacity to care about um, its location in the milieu that we'll be creating for it. And two things I need to say, just by way of kind of contextualizing this, 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 the, this is old tech. We're talking about something that's far more lightweight, far more transparent, than, and, and, and because of processing speeds, of course, the background overlays are going to be far more plausibly real than what we see here. So if that looks clunky to you, it is. But that's just, that's several, again, iterations ago. We're gonna be talking about something, we're talking about something far more uh, sophisticated and seamless than that. Um, but the issue of ownership is, is, is key. That, that, that we, we can get there. We can, we can make people care about their bodies in that world. And hopefully, through their body, other people's bodies. So, I think as a genocide scholar, I mean, this is the question that I've, I've thought maybe most about. Like, I mean, so what? What does this matter to um, debates, for example, about uh, whether or not settler colonialism were in, the, in the Americas was in fact genocide? <coughs> Right, um, and I think you know I would like to sort of offer these as five kind of provisional responses to the question. I mean, first of all, I think embodying empathy matters because it concerns an institution that lies at the heart of what many of us consider to be the attempted genocide of Canadian Indigenous people. And in this regard, I've been influenced by uh, a number of scholars, but most importantly, Andrew Wolford, whose work on um, uh, the Indian residential schools has claimed that it's part of a nodal network of destruction predicated upon um, the construction of indigeneity as a problem in need of overcoming and therefore organized specifically to destroy uh, indigenous group life, right? To interrupt the, the, the flow of indigenous culture, um, to degrade it, and uh, to degrade those who, who uh, identified with it. Okay, and so there, there is a sense for those of us working in this tradition, which is the Lemkinian tradition, and thinking about um, uh, what genocide is, that this is a very, uh, that, that um, not only did genocide occur, but the residential schools um, were genocidal and, and, and contributed to this genocide. So immersion in this world should help us to make that point more vivid, more persuasive. Secondly, I think it studies empathy. Um, well, I know it studies empathy, but, but, but I think that um, because it studies empathy, what it does is it, it potentially sheds light on uh, an, an attribute of our social and moral lives that we know to play a part in reconciliation and restorative justice, right? We, uh, and th th this is contested, but I, I think we're working from the position that in order to uh, know how to reconcile or what reconciliation needs to mean, 
you have to, in some sense, as a kind of partner in the reconciliatory, conciliatory process, you have to somehow enter into the lives of others, right? It's not enough simply to sort of stand within your own subject position and, and negotiate um, in, a, in a closed off sort of way. Whatever reconciliation needs to become is something that has to be arrived at dialogically and it has to involve an element of self-transcendence that is part of parcel of or animated by, if you like, what, the, 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 this, thing called, this thing called empathy. Um, I think additionally it should matter to genocide scholars because it represents or is attempting to represent traumatic experiences so, um, and in the case of the rape of children, um, so inherently traumatic and distressing that to some extent their inner specificity eludes description. Right? We can't really know any more than we can know what it's like to die exactly. Um, this virtuality may get us closer to the, uh, the idos of this, like the, the kind of core qualities of the traumatic experience such that it becomes possible to fully understand what a victim, um, what, what made a victim a victim, right? It just brings us closer to that thing that's caused the kind of suffering, um, the legacies of which oblige us to reconcile, right? Once again. Um, so it, it, it reveals a kind of hidden, uh, an otherwise hidden phenomenological content, I guess. I think what we have here as well, and we see it in other contexts, I was talking to Alejandro earlier today about the, um, the use by the Shoah Foundation of holograms to, uh, to animate uh, survivor testimony, Holocaust survivor testimony. I mean, what we get here is just another way of thinking about how to present testimony. And that should matter to us as genocide scholars also, because testimony matters uh, for a variety of reasons to um, the scholarship and uh, the, 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 to genocide scholarship and, uh, and, and post-conflict uh, understanding. And I think, again, one of the things that we're, one of the reasons it matters to genocide scholars is that um, we see this investment by museums and, 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 and other institutions, um, which are assuming that somehow the technology will in fact bridge the distance between the victim and the secondary witness to atrocity. But it's exactly those assumptions that we're questioning, we're trying to work out the, um, the details of, and that, that should help us as, as genocide scholars understand the work the museums are, uh, need to do, right? And, their, and, their and the chance that they, they have of succeeding in their projects. Now, I wanted to talk a bit about why the issue of indigenous genocide has, has become hard for us, in Canada in particular. I, I actually haven't got a very good sense of where this issue is on the, in the kind of discursive landscape of the United States. My sense is um, uh, that it's not much of anywhere at all, although I was, you know, I was on a panel last year with Andrea Smith, who has obviously talked about this um, at, and at some length. I know there are other scholars working on this issue, but in terms of the kind of mainstream American discussion about identity politics um, and social justice, it seems to me the issue of indigenous genocide isn't really part of, it doesn't figure all that prominently in that, in that discussion. It's not like people aren't talking about it, it's just that the broad mass of Americans don't seem to notice that it's getting talked about. Um, in Canada, the broad mass of Canadians are talking about it. Um, and, Unfortunately, we're not agreeing about it, and I think that's making a project like this um, worthwhile, but but challenging in, in, in all kinds of ways. Um, I think matters weren't helped this summer or early fall with the release of the executive summary of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation in the final report by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Um, in that report, the justices it described what was undergone by indigenous people in residential schools as cultural genocide. And, um, to, and I, I wrote about this, a number of us sort of wrote to challenge this particular way of talking about it. Um, we're not comfortable with it for a couple of reasons. One, um, it's, it's a tactical usage of the idea of genocide to uh, basically acculturate Canadians very gently to the idea that a substantial harm was done to the nation's indigenous people. Um, but it seems to me that it's a hard truth that doesn't get any easier to swallow by degrees. Genocide is genocide. The primary harm in genocide is the destruction of a group. 
that destruction can be achieved through the destruction of culture, just as it can be achieved through the destruction of bodies. <laughs> Raphael Emkin thought the genocide consisted of two, uh, like two processes, two possible processes. One he called barbarism, which was the destruction of, of the production of, of, of physical bodies. The other, which was vandalism, which was the destruction of culture. Both yielded the same effect. Genocide, the principal harm of which was the shattering of a group's life, right? Um, uh, so and I mean, we, don't, we can go into that discussion if you want to later. But in any case, um, to call something cultural genocide is to actually just be redundant, I think. Um, the primary harm was the destruction of indigenous people's group life. Um, and you know, there, there was physical destruction as well. There was uh, deliberate introduction of disease in settler colonialism. There was, uh, we've learned recently about um, uh, nutritional experiments that were conducted without consent on indigenous children in the north. Um, we know that there were uh, there was dispossession from the land and means of uh, of sustainable self sufficiency. Um, the, you know the, the kind of the process of destroying group life involved uh, indigenous group life involved more than just the destruction of culture, um, but the residential schools were um, destroyed. And, and in the residential schools, we also find instances of murder. I will say that. Um, but regardless, um, the whether or not Settler colonialism in Canada was genocidal, has very little to do with whether or not um, culture was primarily destroyed or bodies were primarily produced or what have you. That's just that's irrelevant, um, at, like, at, at, just for that nomenclature. And then I think, secondly, there is this extremely crass ethnocentrism that as, uh, I'm constantly, you know, this is the ivory tower, right? You, you sort of move in more progressive liberal circles in universities. And every so often, you look over the parapet, you shout down to somebody, and they shout something back that's horrific to you. And what we found in the wake of uh, the release of the TRC's report um, and was, was an objection by many prominent Canadians to the idea that there was anything genocidal in European settlement in the Americas. Conrad Black, um, newspaper baron, ex-Lord Black before he got put in jail for several years uh, for um, financial malfeasance, um, he uh, wrote a very kind of prominent editorial that was much discussed, which is worth looking at just in terms of its uh, entrenched, uh, well, Eurocentric condescension. He says, the native people of First Nations were here first, but there were not more than a few hundred thousand of them in what is now Canada in the 17th century. They had a Stone Age culture that had not invented the wheel and which graduated, however, brusquely to more sophisticated levels of civilization, but the culture was not exterminated. It is not the case that Europeans have no right to be here, and we have made vastly more of this continent than its original inhabitants could have done. Despite everything, even the First Nations should be grateful that the Europeans came here. There has been quite enough shameful conduct to, ground, to go around, including by some of the natives. Let's all repent past wrongdoings without demeaning histrionics and hyperbole. So it's like, get over it. You know, you're better off than you would have been, get over it. That's, that's the one version of the response. In a way, more hurtful, um, and um, I and, and Andrew and, and some other colleagues um, generated a formal response to this in the national press, was a response by two colleagues of mine at the University of Manitoba, an emeritus professor of education, um, Robert, Rodney Clifton, and an absolutely insane um, right-wing retired anthropologist um, named Jaime Rubenstein, who's, his, I mean, who's been on the record about, uh, uh, I, just won't, I won't go into it, but like he's, been, he's, he's published uh, screeds against homosexuals and other, uh, and, and other groups and that are com completely out of bounds. But Clifton and Rubenstein, <laughs> Rubenstein just sent me last week, sent me an article he's published in a right-wing newsletter um, that actually just reiterates all the things we were challenging him and Clifton on in this response. But they published a response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, where um, they claimed that um, this kind of education, education students got in the residential schools. To call it education is to overstate the case. There were some elite residential schools that produced a generation of indigenous leaders. They were exceptions, not the rule. Most residential schools radically, chronically undereducated their students. Many of them contained um, the dregs of the religious orders who were responsible for overseeing them, people who committed profound acts of violence against the children uh, in their care, physical violence and sexual violence. This is documented in the testimony that we've got. 
Um, so, you know, we're not making this up, we're not overemphasizing it. This is just part of the historical record. Now, Clifton and Rubenstein argue um, that, uh, you know, cultures change. All education changes people. Immigrants come, they have to go to educational institutions, they have to become a Canadian or American. We don't talk about that as genocide, right? Um, this, again, grossly distorts the character of the education being received by students at Indian residential schools, just to be clear. Um, so, was the goal of educating children, uh, the children of the millions of disadvantaged immigrants who came from all over the world during the same period resulting in the same acculturation, spuriously called cultural genocide that has occurred around the world since the origin of human beings? When we call all Aboriginal children educated in residential school survivors, this erroneously implies that they are equivalent to Holocaust survivors. And actually deep in this piece is a worry that somehow or other, by sort of looking at cultural genocide as genocide, we're, we're, we're somehow diminishing um, the genocidal character of the Holocaust as a paradigmatic act of mass violence. Somehow, there's this kind of suffering Olympics that's going on here, and this worry that if we start talking about cultural destruction um, as the same as the production of these vast piles of bodies, uh, as in any sense the same, that the one is cheapened in the comparison, right? that this is distorted. Um, but remember, like whether or not there were piles of bodies is not, strictly speaking, relevant to whether or not genocide has occurred, because genocide is not about the production of bodies, it's about the destruction of what I'll call humankind, it's about groups, right? Destroy the group, that's the harm of genocide. The rest of it is a crime against humanity, and of course we have greater and lesser crimes against humanity, right? Like in terms of scale, so no, no question. Um, so there are differences there. But if we're talking about genocide, what we're talking about is group destruction. Um, so Krypton and Rubenstein basically say, you know, there's, you know, this was good for people. These schools were good for people. So, um, when this came out, of course, we were working with a group of survivors who are, 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 are um, part of the, the superstructure of our project, right? They, they're the governing council that is shaping and directing our, our research. Our methodology is, uh, is, 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 is entirely dependent on what they tell us we can do. And of course, when these debates arise, and, and the, our, our, our main co-applicant is, is Ted Fontaine, an extraordinary person, his memoir, Broken Circles, extraordinary book. Um, when these debates occur, of course, they look on us as non-indigenous people and they distrust us, right? We're, we're not, like, it's, it's hard to gain somebody's trust. And we had tremendous difficulty with our indigenous partners getting them to accept the gift of tobacco we attempted to offer them in exchange for their signature on our ethics protocols, because we couldn't listen to them until they signed off on the ethical protocols. Um, but, which we had designed, by the way, in terms of um, prevailing OCAP regulations, which are regulations for research, it's, a, it's part of an indigenous set of research protocols designed by the Assembly of First Nations, lar initially, I think, to regulate um, bioprospecting and other kinds of uh, use of indigenous medical data. But um, that we have, uh, we are indebted to in our own methodology insofar as we have given up all rights to intellectual property that are connected to our project. All of the tech we're gifting to our, uh, our Aboriginal partners. Um, we are making the technology available to anybody <coughs> in an Indigenous community who would like to see it. There's no sense other than the kind of mu the professional sense of writing articles and showing up at events like this that, that it's a benefit to us individually. And we're allowing our Indigenous partners to edit everything and, and, and see first everything that we produce that's in the name of this particular project. And we, so we, this is all part of our ethical protocol, and this and more. And uh, what we got from our advisory council was, well, show us more. Show us your budget. How are you spending this money? Who's getting paid what? And you know that's not something we're used to doing. And then it was like, well, change the language here in this, in this part of the proposal. Change this objective here. And we had to say, okay, well, we were serious about collaborating with you because that's the thing. In decolonizing a research methodology means turning research subjects into research collaborators, right? Somehow putting people you're working on into the driving seat so they can determine what it means to work with them to produce something. And um, uh, it, took, it literally took months, and I think the whole time my reading of this is that we were tested. Our, we could, it was easy enough for us to say that we're open to any possible thing that they say, it was quite another to be asked to change stuff that was fundamental to the project, that we had spent a couple of years generating a concept of, right? To do away with that, to reform that, cost us something. Um, and uh, and we, we changed it. 
we changed it because this is a genuine partnership. We've had to change it in response to the needs of our stakeholders. Um, I'm running out of time. I, I knew I'd over-prepared, um, <laughs> which is okay. But I think, you know, we're struggling with some stuff. Let me just conclude then very, very, very briefly. And just say, like, the project still has questions to answer that are important. I think, you know, we don't know how realistic an experience this needs to be to produce the kinds of feelings that are going to be conducive to empathetic identification. We have a particular issue when it comes to the representation of child, childhood trauma. We cannot legally depict a child being raped. It violates laws concerning child pornography. And yet, our survivors tell us they want this to be explicit. More than that, we're being pressed by intergenerational survivors, the children and grandchildren of these residential school uh, survivors. We're being pressed by them to make the representation as direct and uh, realistic as possible when it comes to that. So we, we're just sort of, okay, it's, it's difficult to think of how to do that and actually make it work. We worry about re-traumatizing people, especially survivors who end up using the world, right? So do you have warning labels? Where do the warning labels? How does this, how does this work? We've got ideas, but this is something we're going to be working th uh, through. Which experiences to pick? Do we just pick trauma? Because that's the thing. You find, start reading through the transcript. Not every minute was hell on earth, right? Um, the survivors talk about the joy of sport. Sport got them out of the building. They, they enjoyed playing hockey. Uh, gave them something to do in wintertime. Um, some chores were worth doing um, because it got them out of the, the kind of dominating gaze of the, the priests and the nuns. You know, there were, there, were, there, were, there were moments of joy in all of this as well. Um, how do you begin a story like this? Is it a story or is it just episodes? Like how do you stitch this together narratively? Um, again, are there some experiences that we're just not going to talk about? That we just say, like, these are out of bounds. Again, these are not our calls to make as researchers, right? Like this is something we have to negotiate with and, and discuss as long as it takes, you know, with the, the stakeholders. And then, of course, what point of entry will there be for the user? Do you enter that world as you? Do you enter as a child? And one of the things we've been talking about is what it would mean for a user of this world to go in and have your hair cut immediately because that was, that was one of the first things that was done to you. Be assigned an ill-fitting set of clothes, for example, like is that, is that it, so, but then somehow it doesn't seem quite right to, in, in all your bourgeois comfort to sort of just sort of adopt a, a kind of, the, the, the kind of costume of a residential school survivor. So like who do you come in as? Can you come in as a priest or a nun? Can you come in as a perpetrator, right? These are questions that we're attempting to resolve. Now, I'll conclude with absolutely this. It takes about a minute. Oh, rats. Um, it's just a very short clip of an analogous project that's going on at USC right now that's being done by um, Nani de la Pena at, at USC to give you an idea of why um, or the way in which feelings can be generated productively in envir environments like the one I've been talking about. Um, she, Nani de la Pena is a pioneer of what's called immersive journalism. And her project, Syria Project, she has a number of these projects. Um, her project, Syria, um, uh, is about Syrian refugees. But what she's done on this little clip, um, she films um, a mortar attack, or she's digitized a mortar attack on Aleppo. And um, you give you some idea of the power of immersion. And you have to imagine that you're immersed in this environment. experience something, we change, you know, the world is dynamic, hers is static, right, and we have lighter headgear and so forth, but that's something like the sort of thing.
That, that was really interesting. I wish I'd seen it over the summer. Um, I wonder if you've given any kind of thought of kind of scaling it um, in terms of age. I mean, there's some things in there that are really traumatic. Um, you talked about your, your eight-year-old um, <coughs> learning about these this, these residential schools in in school now. Um, you know, is there is there is it going to be kind of a blanket experience, or is it going to be tailoring maybe to have some of that introductory um, experiences for a younger generation, maybe? Because that's that's really that's something that's really traumatic. Um, and has the potential to be really traumatizing, I would imagine, for you. So, in terms of what we're planning to do with the um, evaluation, um, the site team that we're working with is going to be bringing university age students. Um, and survivors, with if they're basically three groups, intergenerational survivors, survivors, <coughs> and university students, we're calling naive users who have no <coughs> real understanding of the residential school system, and they'll be experiencing the world in a kind of laboratory situation. Um, we then partner, one of our partners is Urban Shaman Gallery, which is uh, can probably Canada's leading um, indigenous arts uh, indigenous arts gallery in Winnipeg, <coughs> and they're going to be hosting an exhibition of the virtual world, and at that point, we. We, we don't have control over who gets to use that. Um, and so there are a number of choices that we've got available to us at the level of design that we've been discussing, one of which is to make rooms within the school, which will be as realistic as possible, right? But there were certain rooms um, within which certain forms of trauma occurred with more reliability than other, like the priest's bedrooms, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so we were thinking about making rooms that only some people of a certain age could go in. But again, how to do that um, is nothing that we can just say, well, we're going to do it this way. This has to be something that, from the survivor's perspective, is true to their experience of those spaces, right? And, um, uh, but, but yeah, obviously, you know, something, well, we'd have to have at the outside of the, you know, 18 plus or something, something. But, you know, where do we put that line? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's going to be people who are younger than 18 who are going to want to and need to know. We've gone up to... The school we're using is basically a school that was run on um, Seguin First Nation north of Winnipeg. Um, it's where Ted is from. It's where a lot of our uh, survivors are work we're working with are from. Is, uh, are from. And um, we went up and talked to a group of high school, grade 11, grade 12, high school students up there. They have an amazing English teacher who's uh, doing terrific work with them on, on documenting residential school history. They want to know. They want to go. There were 16, 17, 18 year olds in there. So where, how to draw these lines is going to be very difficult. Sure. I, I, I have like, super mixed feelings about this whole project. I'm sure I'm not the first person to um, uh, suggest that, but it just, I, 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 we've had a lot of conversations in this collective uh, and in our, our group about visual images and imagery and the ethics of representation. And um, I understand that you're bending over backwards to work with the survivors, and that that in and of itself is a really interesting um, that 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 that's an, an interesting response to this to this concern. But you it, you know I I worry about a number of things having work, about secondary traumatization and what kind of work do you do with. Uh, with those who are participating either before they actually go through this experience or after. I understand that you want to study empathy, yeah. but it, there's a part of this that feels a little milgram -y yeah. to me. Um, what, 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 you know, that I'm feeling like the pers the people, there, there are several groups that I'm concerned about. One is that, um, uh, you know, one is, cer is certainly the people going through the experience, like what is that that they're expecting to get out of it, and what, um, and, and then just in terms of accuracy, like the, the sense of the survivors wanting their most powerful experiences represented seems important to me, but there's also this temporal um, reality, which is, they experience those experiences over a long period of time, and if you take the actor, not the actor, but the whatever you call the, the visitor, 
through this site and they're experiencing these really profound traumatic experiences in a short period of time, um, you know, like what are our ethical obligations to all these parties? So I, I'd be really interested in light of that, not that you answer my necessarily my ethical questions, mm -hmm. but in, in hearing about the conversation that led you to this project in the first place and who was involved in that conversation and, you know, what kind of outcomes are you hoping for other than, um, you, you know, um, a, a memory project that's really unique and important. So anyway, that's a really unformed question that I'm just throwing all of my reactions at. You know, I think that the, that response is one that um, is uh, we have heard before. We have uh, articulated ourselves uh, to ourselves before. It's those concerns are real, and um, our ethical protocols obviously have had to anticipate to some degree the concerns that that you're talking about and, and attempt to organize or uh, some kind of response in, in relation to them. So. Um, Every meeting we have with the survivors um, includes a support worker. Um, our ethical guidelines require us to have support workers present during the use of this. This is something that's going to be extremely difficult, and we're not sure how to deal with this yet when it comes to gifting the world to communities where we're not actually present and overseeing the use of the project. So that's a whole other thing that we'll have to figure out. We don't, don't know that yet. Um, we, we have a ritual um, smudging at the beginning and actually in the last meeting which was devastating because and, and it, the last meeting we had which is about six weeks ago um, one of the inter we have an intergenerational survivor working with us as an RA and just to be clear I was telling Alejandro today my view is we don't want to be explicit like my whole my <laughs> my thinking about art is that like I would prefer if we're about feeling that I think we can get to those feelings without um, you know, hyper-realism, you know, we can get there through abstraction, we can get there through um, various forms of, uh, of dissociation and unreality rather than, than brute reality. That's my own thinking about this, right? Uh, but we're having this discussion, and, and this, this RA of ours was demanding that we not hold back for the sake of her and her other relatives who needed to know um, the specifics of what had happened to relatives of hers who will not talk about this to her and whose lives um, impact on her and have impacted her and her other siblings and so forth directly. And she really wanted it to be there. She saw us desiring to withhold as symptomatic of, at some level, symptomatic of um, uh, the sort of European culture's reluctance to acknowledge these crimes head on more generally, right? So there was that. So, but, but, you know, that doesn't deal with the ethical concern, but I think ritualizing Points of entrance, point, uh, points of exit. You know, making, making, doing something to sort of uh, establish boundaries around the experience. Probably something we'll end up doing. We know at Urban Shaman we have to have support workers available. We know we have to make that long-term uh, relationships. We're, it's budgeted for. Like we'll be paying people uh, to work with anybody who's gone through this world who needs to talk for months afterwards. Right. So, um, but, but yeah, like exactly how. To navigate that terrain is something that I, I mean, we're figuring out as we go along. I think the stakes are really high. Secondary traumatization is likely. So, so, so can I just ask about this? So, so what? Whose idea was this? In in what is your? In in yeah. in like what is the what is the objective of this project? It's a little bit still unclear to me. What what you're hoping to get out of this? What's the driving? Wow. We're all getting different things out of it. I mean, for, as, a, as a research project, what we're figuring out, partly, is whether or not more immersion equals more empathy, mm -hmm. right? right? Secondly, we're figuring out whether, because of that, the investment by a museum and the kind of a huge segment of museum studies literature is correct in assuming that more immersion, more interplay, more empathy, right? So that, that, that's the main kind of research for, and then you know, I have these more abstract questions about what it means to represent traumatic experience. Does this actually help us to understand it? And what about the affect of quality of such representation? So that's, that's all more speculative stuff. So that, that's the research end of it. Um, it began in the wake of the decision by the Canadian Museum for Human Rights to reserve two permanent galleries in its, museums, in, in its museum design. One for the Holocaust and the other for um, indigenous Canadians within which there would be a residential school exhibition. And the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is, um, by design, a non-artifactual museum. 
they're going to use tech to get these experiences across. So we started asking the question, well, what kind of tech will do the job they need to do? So this became part of a seminar that eventually became the book that just came out. But the minute we mooted the question, then Andrew, who knows Ted and has worked on Ted, with Ted for many years, Ted said, I want to be part of this. I know people, other survivors who want to be part of this. And then all of a sudden it became this thing. And it matters to the community hugely. I'm not overstating the case. Like the survivors, intergenerational survivors, um, they, they, they want this project to happen. It feels like an enormous responsibility and it feels, as a non-indigenous person, uh, with a theoretical interest in, in this, uh, I can't tell you how awkward that feels sometimes. You know, so like, this is not easy work. I have a follow-up question on the ethical measures involved here. And uh, I mean, there, there has been some research on, on these experiential museums where there's an immersion. And you say also about this idea of being inside this world. And the, the, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum would be, it would be an example of that, not this new type of museum. Now, um, the ethical uh, dilemmas that that has raised, uh, according to some scholars, just by looking at the responses they get from the visitor books, like we had a cool experience. This was great. This was, you know, this there's a there's a playfulness, there's a fascination with it in, in, in having this this simulation. It's sort of a, a virtual uh, game, you know, like a, a video game experience. So I, I was wondering what what are your thoughts on that? That there is also uh, the entire world of, of the video games of virtual reality, which is a, a total a, a world of, of uh, first of, of consumerism and other it's, you know, of leisure and of, of, of pleasure. That, that's one question. The other question is on, on a discussion that we have here, uh, we're having continuously in the graduate uh, group and the collaborative, which is on the on the concept of genocide. Uh, John and very often had this, this, this uh, discussion of of cultural genocide, and I just want to, 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 to give it some of back, or at least challenge this idea that it is irrelevant whether the destruction of bodies or the way it's the destruction of cultures. And I mean, it might be irrelevant if it's just a discussion about the concept. And if we, again, we bring in Lemkin, uh, we might find a theoretical argumentation that would define genocide as both. Well, that's fine. But still, is it irrelevant? In the sense, not of doing a, a, a hierarchy of, of, of suffering, because that's not really the issue, but we're talking about really very different historical experiences. And that's the problem often with the, with the concept of genocide um, encompassing very different so that somehow I would like to, to, to see if it implies actually more and whether the use of the term genocide is a statement in itself. So it's looking at it from, 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 a, from a different perspective that equating with those genocides that, I'm not even talking about the Holocaust, I mean let's say Rwanda or Armenia or genocides that are taking place where the physical destruction of members of the community is, is taking place. So equating with those experiences, can we really say it's irrelevant a project of force assimilation, which is, if it's, if it's evil, nobody would question it, with a project of producing, of, you know, of creating factories to produce products. No, that's somehow, uh, so what does the equation actually imply from the others, from, from your perspective? Yeah, I think there's all kinds of ways in which the historical trajectories of genocides matter. Uh, they matter, I think, most obviously in terms of what reconciliatory praxis has to look like in the wake of a genocide, right? Um, it's one thing to say, uh, well, I think the strategies for dealing with um, mass physical violence are not necessarily going to be the same strategies that you deal, uh, you, you deploy to deal with uh, the after effects of mass cultural violence, for example, right? Like they may overlap in some ways, but they may not. And I think there are differences there that need to be attended to. Um, my point was, um, and actually I think the Armenian genocide is a really interesting example because Peter, Peter Balakian, amongst others, has argued that very persuasively that in fact it was the destruction of Armenian churches um, and uh, the cross stones and, um, the, and, and ongoing 
uh, uh, repurposing of sites of Armenian cultural significance that marks not merely denial, but the ongoing perpetration of genocide in that particular case, right? So what you have in the Armenian case, of course, is, is both of these things. Um, is both physical destruction and, and cultural destruction. It's difficult to pull them apart as, as, as genocide, you know? Um, so I, I think, you know, where do they matter? Well, I mean, it matters in terms of, for example, the kinds of human rights abuses we see operative within genocidal context. Mass murder is one kind of human rights abuse. The destruction of church is a different kind of uh, abuse. It's not, I mean, and, and I think to the extent that it, it sort of impinges on freedom of worship, like it's a different kind of human rights abuse. So the kind of explanatory stories we want to tell, the kinds of strategies for of redress that we want to deploy are all going to hinge on those differences. What doesn't hinge on those differences is the, cate is, is the, is, is the, the categorical um, determination of whether or not an event is genocidal. Why? And, and also, what the primary harm is, right? Because what is the primary harm in genocide? It is, like, according to Lemkin, it is the destruction of the groupness of the group, right? That, that, that you know, what, what, what Claudia Card calls um, uh, uh, cultural death or social death, social death, right? That, that's the harm. And it's that, that that's that's what that's why we need a special category le legally and morally for genocide. That's that's what makes it not just a human rights catastrophe. That's what makes it more than just a crime against humanity. It's something else, because it has that particular component to it. That's its singular quality, right? So, you get that with the destruction of culture. You get that with the production of bodies, because again, you can have millions of bodies and not have the destruction of culture. Have a catastrophic human rights. Um, crime against humanity and not have genocide. What makes that, those, those possible bodies genocidal is, is this um, destruction or will to destroy the groupness of the groups. So, um, the other question on, oh. on, the, on, the, on the games and all that? Uh, so much of the, dis the way we have of talking about these environments is indebted to um, the language that's used critically to talk about makes me uneasy, it makes all of us uneasy. Um, you know, so, okay, the problem of pleasure. There are many representations, you can think about Lenny Riefenstahl cinema, for example, that yield pleasure in the production of images that are, are hateful or offensive, right? So there's ways in which um, deriving pleasure from the representation of another suffering, although problematic, is not uniquely problematic to the domain of video games and may be an unintended consequence of the milieu that we produce. I think we're going to be working to m mitigate that as much as we can, but some people may enjoy themselves. What can you do about that? <laughs> I mean, people enjoy strange things for bad reasons all the time. Like, there's not, w beyond trying to anticipate that and trying to design the world in such a way that it minimizes the opportunities for that, fine. But, um, the fact is that the technology we're drawing on and the leading edge of immersive design is coming from the game world. That if you looked at the latest Call of Duty, I don't game at all, but if you look at the latest Call of Duty, it's remarkably fast and fluid and immersive, right? It's not immersive like we're doing it, and I think, you know, the kind of dy dynamic qualities we're building to the world are, are different. Um, and you, it, but, but there's going to be some overlap there. And, uh, whether or not or how much it's problematic is something that we have to see about. Just can't talk to them yet. Yeah. Follow me? Sir? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Um, it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, listening to your um, need for empathy, and I, I agree with that. Uh, I'm thinking your position is very much like that of a writer who's writing fiction where, where he wants to make his, his work of fiction an experience for the reader. Sophie's choice, the, uh, the point group. Uh, George Orwell's uh, 1984 
So you you want to you want to. Uh, Arise motions. So, 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 so that they would be experiencing this. Not just reading it. That's, that's. Thank you, absolutely right. I mean, that's the idea. And the idea is that if you, if that, that these technologies make available forms of associate, emotional association um, that allow for deeper forms of empathetic engagement that we find typically in works of fiction or cinema, precisely because one sees oneself in a different way, immersed in a world that you are moving through and changing, than you do just receiving information from a filmmaker or deriving um, interpretive claims from uh, reading of a book. But that, that experience of embodiment is just makes for a richer um, form of empathetic uh, attachment. That, that's the assumption. Now, maybe not. Right, maybe not. We don't know. We, until we do the psych work, until our, our psychology partners and that team goes in there and assesses, we won't know. But right now, the secondary literature on that is very divided. We don't, like, they, so some people, I mean, people talk about empathy fatigue, they talk about uh, um, moral numbness, that's Cass Sunstein's term for it, right? Like, and they say that this is a byproduct of our. Uh, the omnipresence of these kinds of a respect re requests to care and b the ubiquity of technologies a lot like the gaming technologies right that we frankly just don't respond to that appeal anymore like we just don't hear it um, but there's this other literature that comes from museum studies and some psych literature as well the literature and empathy that suggests in fact this will change us so I think one of the kind of innovative research um, dimensions to what we're doing involves settling that issue as empirically as we can. Sure. Um, thanks for your really um, interesting and thoughtful talk. Um, I had a number of thoughts. Um, one was kind of this issue, I don't know if I want to get into the genocide, but the issue of harm. Uh, the way that, that residential schools are what we call boarding schools in the United States is usually um, talked about is in relation to land policies. And one of the big differences here, in addition to the you know, you mentioned that the Canadian schools were connected to the religious organizations and that was a very separate kind of thing in the United States where it was the federal government um, that managed the, the off-reservation boarding schools. But that, you know, so we tend to think of it as a kind of generational experience here that most people my age think of this as an experience of their grandparents or their great-grandparents because for us it's been public schools since FDR, right? So we we are not really, you know, there were some boarding schools that continued and in mission schools and Catholic organizations that had schools for Indians. But So that's kind of one of the big differences. But I wanted to just mention um, to you a couple of other exhibits that are uh, being developed or that have, have kind of taken place in the US context. Uh, a few of us, about 15 years ago, um, worked on an exhibit at the Heard Museum in Phoenix. Uh, which is sort of interesting. It's it's called the the Heard Museum of Anthropology, but it's been increasingly a fine art museum in the 20th century. And we, a number of us, got involved in a boarding school exhibit there that opened 15 years ago. In fact, this month. Um, and that you know, you're talking about um, people coming. Is it going to make a difference your your exhibit and so forth? The the interesting thing to us after that that exhibit opened in Phoenix 15 years ago, where there's a large urban Indian population as well as, of course, the statewide uh, population of Native people there in that, that area of the Southwest, is that the boarding school exhibit increased attendance dramatically. And it was supposed to be a five-year exhibit, and it's still there 15 years later uh, because of that. And so it also increased uh, the Indian attendance at the museum 100%. So there's tremendous interest, I think, in this topic you know, uh, in the U.S. There is also, a, actually I'm going back next month to Phoenix and we're I have an NEH grant. We're going to develop a traveling uh, exhibit finally after all these years. Um, there's also going to be an exhibit at the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian that will open in, in uh, 2018, which coincides with the 100th anniversary of the closing of the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, which was the first of the off-reservation uh, kind of schools in the U.S. And 
Um, listening to you, we have a colleague, I've, I've been on the board of the NMEI for a few years, and they, we have a colleague on the board who works for Google, and he's a young guy, and so he's always telling us what museum exhibits are going to be like, these uh, very immersive experiences, very affordable, that there are these like little things, not exactly the Google glasses that we're, we're familiar with, but something to me that looks like little viewfinders uh, that museum um, visitors and school children are all going to be using in a few years. So it's interesting to kind of think about what you're doing in the context just of the future of museums. And whether this is going to be, oh, we're all going to give up books and we're all going to have e-readers. You know, I don't, we don't really know where this, this is going in terms of uh, the museum world, but we'll be watching you. <laughs> Thank you. So a couple a couple points. First, I'm going to follow up with you after you get more information about that exhibition. Okay. Um, and I think I've actually heard of it, but I want to make sure. So if okay. you can follow up with you about that. Second, the last Indian residential school closed in Canada in 1996. Yeah. So that's not that long ago. Um, and what it means is, I mean, they had changed significantly sure. right by then. Um, the worst of the kind of violence that we're tracking is really post-World War II till... 1970, even though you know we still have instances of abuse throughout the 70s and into the 80s, so it doesn't end. But uh, mm -hmm. but really, the worst of it is like basically 52 to 70 um, through the 60s. Scoop, of course, when the government went in, um, any Indigenous person who went with um, uh, got involved with social services in some way, they had their children taken away from them and forcibly adopted out into white families. You know, mm -hmm. that happened in the late 1960s, and then. So there's all this kind of state violence that's done throughout right. the, the, the 60s and 70s that compounds the errors of the residential school. And often the parents were in crisis because of their residential school experiences. So they that same conversation, I mean, especially here in Minnesota, where the actually the Indian Child Welfare Act emerged out of this kind of urban community here. And the NMAI, um, I went down actually and talked to curators down there. They've invited us to come. Um, uh, when we have tech to talk about, they have mm -hmm. brown bags. And they've invited us to come Good. whenever we'll be in touch with them and, and go down and talk to them more about the curatorial end of this because that is this is partly a museum studies project and they're struggling you know they're struggling to find a, a representational language that makes the stories they want to tell more compelling like when I was there it was basically not empty but you know they they, they, they struggle they told me they struggle they're getting visitors to go back more than once right that, that this is something that they, they, they they're working on tweaking their design to accommodate and I think potentially if this something like this works it does represent um, a way of thinking about um, engagement and outreach in ways that may uh, put bums in seats if you see what I mean so but it's an amazing institution it's like I, I actually really enjoyed the exhibition and they have uh, stuff on Manitoba we had some land very that was like within a few miles of one of the exhibitions that they are uh, one of the, uh, the, the Stations that they had in their exhibition on Métis life, so it was. I, I was. I was really. I, I'm impressed with the space and the, the people there. Have you done another question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to try to formulate this clearly, although we'll see how it comes out. Um, I'm curious about the within the virtual environment, the going in and out. How you guys are organizing the coming in and the coming out of the world, and I'm asking this because. In the little clip that you showed, there was a, some indication about how these virtual environments for the user feels quite real. Yep. Um, and I'm asking less on, well, first of all, it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about who, the, who these users are, because I'm concerned or thinking about when it comes to the questions of the real, sometimes um, when we think about the person represented or these people being represented, which are these historic, which is the people from young youth or people at this residential boarding school in a historical time frame. Um, I'm curious about if the virtual encounter becomes a kind of safe encounter in ways that make it more difficult where we have a concern of how to deal with real bodies outside of. I mean, there are still Native American. I mean, there are Native Americans, they're first world people outside of the virtual space that are different kind, maybe a different kind of body and how, how this practice of empathy, how, how the translation across these two different real places is supposed to take place, especially when we talk about the possibility of dealing with colored bodies, the danger of, of being able to deal with them through video, through media, for, from, through photography, mm -hmm. through an, an immersive experience, like a safer or more comfortable way of dealing it than, than in the real world and on the street or something like that. Because we can control access points, at least when we come to talk about the real in this, in this quest, in this immersive experience. So, I guess the question is, 
what kind of prep happens, what kind of conversations between bodies before going into the virtual immersive experience, how do they encounter, how, how are the people that go into the immersive experience when they come out, how are they supposed to translate then into the real bodies outside? I mean, how do, how do you guys form a conversation for people around this? Yeah. So this is something that we see on the horizon, but I don't have a really good answer for you at this point in time, partly because the person responsible for that is Catherine Starzik, mm -hmm. a psychologist who has done other related sorts of studies on empathy, and will know how to prime and how to assess um, the outcomes of this particular form of engagement. Now, one of the things, so okay, a couple things. You're absolutely right that I think um, it's possible that it's far easier to care in a mediated way uh, than it is to care out there in the world, but that's actually one of our research questions. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing a longitudinal study coming out of the project so that we know we're going to be looking at um, immediately out, three months out, six months out, and assessing using whatever heuristics that uh, Catherine has at her disposal to see whether or not people's baseline dispositions and comportment uh, and conduct uh, have changed, right? Now, whether or not they have, it's, you know, it's grist for our mill, but we don't know in advance, right? But the fact is that um, it seems like that, that, you know, that's maybe the best we've got. Maybe nothing will, like nothing mediated will ever change people in a deeply substantial way. I think we have evidence that going to museums does in some way, shape, or form, change understandings, which changes attitudes, which changes conduct. But exactly how much more change we can expect and how enduring that change is as a result of immersion, we just, that, that we, we're not at all clear on. Point of entry, again, we're, you know, uh, presumably there's going to be some form of study to figure out what the baselines are prior to people using this world so we can figure out who and what they are. We have three groups going through, at least for the laboratory portion of this. When it's in the community, it's whatever, whoever comes. But for the study part of it, like we have three groups. We have the survivors who will be using it, we'll have intergenerational survivors and naive users, right? Um, and they will be identified, we'll figure out what their values and, and, and desires and outlooks are as well as we can, as well as psychology can tell us they are, and that then we'll just see if there are differences on the other end of it. The interesting thing that, I mean, one of the things that I think we, we've been, when we've been talking about this the last several months, is actually what entering the world is going to look like. And the survivors have told us how much, like we said, where does the world begin? Does it begin at the fence line? Like, are you gonna, like, does this begin walking through some kind of road, on, up some kind of road toward a structure? Like, where, does it begin with you coming into a world at the foot of some stairs? And it turns out for them, for them, and they're thinking about when residential school began for them, it begins pa crossing the threshold. And somehow that front door, which they all remember in incredible detail, that front door stands there in front of them as this, as this moment that inaugurates a transition that comes to its end when their parents disappear. Oftentimes, the mother or father says they have, they've been told to say that they need to go to the bathroom. The child sits there in this kind of ante room, which we have great descriptions about, and the parents go to the bathroom and never come back, mm -hmm. right? And so well, that, that's going to be incorporated into our point of entry. So, I mean, aesthetically, representationally, that some version of that door, that, that liminal passage, and a, uh, an experience of abandonment will be incorporated into the first part of the of the world, but um, I guess I wasn't actually asking so much the entry point from the point not mm -hmm. from when we not what when you're inside the immersive technology. I was actually curious about the person to person prep going into actually yeah. putting on the helmet and then how to think about taking off the helmet and then you see other bodies around you. Yeah, yeah. Some of them. That's why I wanted to know who these users were, and then also how they were, how we were encountering other kinds of real bodies afterwards. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that 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 I'm like we. That's the psych psychology end of it. Okay. So, Catherine, no. Yeah. I think we have time for one more short question, short answer. Right. Oh, you. Yeah. No. Okay. Oh, I just had a question. Um, I know that you said you talked with um, that you've been working with the, the survivors, and that they really. Um, are supportive of this and um, have you ever like met any or um, encountered any natives who have objected to this or who have um, like hesitations or you know? yeah.
Okay, so uh, truthfully, no. Um, and that's not to say that there might not, there, there presumably are people who think of this is creepy and unnecessary. Like I'm just assuming there are such people out there who have many of the same reservations that have been voiced here and which um, to, like I, I share in various ways to different degrees, right? Um, so presumably there are people who are circumspect about such an issue. Also, I mean, it's, it's again uncomfortable being uh, three white university, well, Catherine, four white university researchers plus Ted. Uh, you know, Ted, he does, he's done a lot of work on our behalf making us seem respectable and trustworthy, right? But at the end of the day, the identity politics, institutional politics are such that you can just assume there's going to be indigenous stakeholders with an experience of these institutions and whiteness that are going to be very circumspect about what we're doing or hostile to it. But I think what, what was revealing to me actually, um, so the, the, the press got a hold of this about two years ago and um, when we were starting to gear up to do the, the project and they wanted to do a story on it. So the, the CBC came and they interviewed us for the project and uh, unbeknownst to us, they went out and they started in, in interviewing um, survivors of the residential school, like people who weren't part of our circle at all, right? Like they just, these were people completely. And when I heard that, I was nervous, right? Because I thought, oh my God, what if? What if? There's just real like anxiety or pain. Like, we, we don't want to traumatize anybody. Like this is supposed to be part of like we conceiving this as a, as, a, as a project contributing to reconciliation, right? What if it's not? What if this is just um, exploitative, perceived as exploitative and, and, and demeaning, right? Um, and what was amazing was the people who they talked to about this, I don't know if that was an editing issue or what, but all of them said that they thought this was worthwhile um, and they were glad people were doing it. To be honest, the prevailing sense we get from people not directly associated with the project is that they're just grateful people, like white people, are noticing mm -hmm. and think enough of their historical experience to attempt to invest their time and money in such a thing, you know? That's not to say that with respect to the archive or the TRC archive or other things, there aren't real debates about how this knowledge is used. But, you know, nobody's participating in this who hasn't agreed to participate. We're not using any data that hasn't been uh, allowed to be used in a way like this. So, you know, my hope is that, and I'm sure there's going to be criticism, but we haven't encountered a strong, any kind of strong form of it yet. Thank you, Adam. Let me, uh, finally, actually, since the camera is recording, and I completely forgot to thank the Institute for Advanced Studies, <laughs> who is, uh, has generously funded this collaborative. I didn't see at the beginning, and so I do this for the record. And uh, <laughs> now I uh, want to thank you, Adam, for, for sharing with us this, this project, and I wish you good luck. And it's a really, we, we see also from the questions and concerns, you know, but, but I guess it's not new to you. It, this is a, a huge challenge, but a, a very important project. So thank you very much, and thank you all for coming.